Well, good evening. I'm Jim Brett Campbell, Executive Director at the National Ranching Heritage Center, where we tell real stories about real ranches. Through our more than 50 historic ranching structures, we trace the development of the ranching industry and lifestyle across more than 200 years. One way we do that is to use our historical structures to demonstrate what life was like for the people who called them home, especially during the holidays. For more than 40 years, candlelight at the ranch has been a tradition on the South Plains. Each year, visitors to the National Ranching Heritage Center step into a living Christmas card as candlelight at the ranch recreates a frontier holiday similar to those on the open prairie from 1780 to 1950. The event includes more than 4,000 luminarias lining the paths of the historic park as volunteer ranch hosts dress in period clothing to recreate holiday scenes from different eras. Generations of guests have had a glimpse into the past to see a lonely cowboy at a far-flung line camp bunkhouse to a festive party at the Victorian Mansion. Tonight, we want to take you on a trip back in time and what the holiday season might have looked like in different eras. Our trail boss tonight is none other than Red Stegall, whom many consider the official ambassador of ranching and cow country. Red has performed his western swing music and cowboy poetry throughout the West and has kept ranching in front of mainstream audiences through his syndicated radio show and his television show, Red Stegall is somewhere west of Wall Street. Now let's head on down the trail with Red. Hi, I'm Red Stegall, and tonight I'm at one of my favorite places in the whole world, the National Ranching Heritage Center. For over four decades, the center has put on a special event, Candlelight at the Ranch. I'm delighted to be your guide through winter and the holidays on ranches of the past as candlelight comes to your living room. So what did Christmas mean to a cowboy? Omar Barker sums it up nicely in his poem, A Cowboy's Christmas Prayer. I ain't much good at praying, and you may not know me, Lord. For I ain't much seen in churches where they preach thy holy word. But you may have observed me out here on the lonely plains, uh, looking after cattle, feeling thankful when it rains, and admiring thy great handiwork, the miracle of grass, and aware of thy kind spirit in the way it comes to pass that hired men on horseback and the livestock that we tend can look up at the stars at night and know we've got a friend. So here's old Christmas coming on, reminding us again of him who's come and brought goodwill into the hearts of men. The cowboy ain't no preacher, Lord, but if you'll hear my prayer, I'll ask as good as we have got for all men everywhere. Don't let no hearts be bitter, Lord. Don't let no child be cold. Make easy beds for them that's sick and them that's weak and old. Let kindness bless the trail we ride, no matter what we're after and sort of keep us on your side in tears as well as laughter. I've seen old cows a-starving, and that ain't no happy sight. Please don't leave no one hungry, Lord, on thy good Christmas night. No man, no child, no woman, and no critter on four feet. I'll do my doggone best to help you find them chuck to eat. I'm just a sinful cowpoke, Lord. Ain't got no business praying. But still, I hope you'll catch a word or two of what I'm saying. We speak of Merry Christmas, Lord. And I reckon you'll agree there ain't no Merry Christmas for nobody that ain't free. So one thing more I ask you, Lord. Just help us what you can to save some seeds of freedom for the future sons of man. What do you say we begin our candlelight walk through history on a cold winter evening in 1780? in Zapata County, Texas, at a building called Los Corralitas, or the Little Corrals. Spanish explorers made an indelible impression on the history of ranching in the United States. Each successful colonization effort by Spain's subjects shared one thing in common, livestock. Missionaries and soldiers conducting entradas into Texas in the 18th century brought herds of cattle into the open territory. The promise of a profitable cattle ranching industry propelled the migration of Spanish settlers north to establish the first Texas cattle ranchers, and in some cases, the only settlements in the area. Built in 1780 by Jose Borrego, 
This fortified structure was built to protect his family from marauders and hostile indigenous tribes. Only basic furniture and utensils fill the house. And on this cold winter's night, it's filled with song. Vengan pastores del campo que el rey de los reyes ha nacido ya. Vengan antes que amanezca, que ya apunta el día y la noche se va. Al vaque se tronto mi laurel, que el niño se duerme al amanecer. Llegué de pinchas y chuquis de Amingui, San Pedro de Araujo y Pumán. Antes que nadie le adore, que si o si flores le vamos a llevar al parque Cedrón, Tomillo y Laurel, que el niño se duerme al amanecer. Our next stop is El Capote Cabin, circa 1838, near the Guadalupe River bottom country where pecan, elm, hickory, oak, cypress, cottonwood, and walnut trees grew, the one-room El Capote Cabin was built. The rustic dwelling was part of the Capote Six Leagues, a stock farm located upon a plateau between the Oakville Escarpment and the Austin Chalk Cuesta, that's Spanish for the Cape. El Capote was named for the nearby hills that spread out like a flowing cloak. The cabin has existed under the governance of three flags, the Republic of Texas, the United States of America, and the Confederate States of America. Life in a one-room cabin was simple. On a cold winter's night, occupants would likely be warming by a fire, cooking a meal, and getting rest under a pile of hides and quilts. The holidays could be a quiet and somber affair in the sparsely populated hills of Central Texas. This evening we have two frontiersmen sharing warmth and a simple meal.
Let's journey to the mid-19th century and see what's taking place in Mason County, Texas at Hedgewigs Hill. The beautiful hill country of Texas beckons settlers with its Llano River running clear and forests of cypress, pecan, and oak trees growing thick throughout the river valley. The builder of Hedgewigs Hill was Lewis Martin. He was among some of the first 7,000 Germans who traveled to Texas in 1844 as part of an agreement between the government of the Republic of Texas and German officials. And since we're talking about the holidays, it's important to point out that German immigrants brought many Christmas traditions to America. Christmas is a time filled with traditions and imagery, and there are countless German words associated with it. For example, Tannenbaum means Christmas tree. German Christians were the first to bring the trees into their homes to decorate. And soon the whole of Europe caught up with the trend and the English royalty popularized it among the elite. Christmas trees came to America with German immigrants and was accepted by the general public only in the late 1800s. And with it being Christmas Eve, we we'll always read the story about the coming of Christ and why he came, correct? And it says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. That's a story about the birth of Jesus. And that's why we celebrate Christmas. Isn't that great? Night. Our next stop will take us to Palo Pinto County in the 1870s at the home of George Joel. According to a history of North and West Texas published in 1906, Joel was a Texan of the purest water. George often joined with the townsfolks of Palo Pinto in a stockade across the street from the courthouse for protection when Indian attacks were foretold. In 1870, he married Leanna T. Dobbs and moved 15 miles out of town. He pursued his ranching career and knew the situation his family might have to face when he took his herds to market. The story is told that one night in 1872, while George was away on a cattle drive, the horses began neighing and the cattle moved about restlessly. Leanna Joel remembered her father who had been scalped and killed earlier in the year, so the encounter with Native Americans was still fresh on her mind. She grabbed her baby and with a hired hand rode hard to a neighbor's house. When she returned, she found her home burned to the ground. Well, George was determined to build a home that would withstand further intrusion by the Comanche. He hired a stonemason to construct a two-story rock house. When completed, 
The two-room house had rifle slits above the main door to protect a horse corral in front of the house. These openings were cut on an angle so that an arrow could not enter. A trap door was cut in the first floor ceiling and a ladder was kept nearby so the family could climb to the top floor, pull up the ladder, and be safe. A wooden outer staircase was added after the threat of attacks had passed. For our next stop, let's look in on the cowboys at the J.Y. Masterson bunkhouse. The crew is saddled up and the chuck wagon has been hitched. The year is 1880. The cowboys were young, many having left their homes to sign on with a cow outfit in hopes of seeing the country and working with horses. Theirs was a poorly paid and dangerous job, whether they were on the trail or at the ranch. Many of these cow hands had very little education and few possessions but they had horse sense, so to say. A sense of humor helped a cowboy cope with the responsibilities of his job. Cowboying has gained a questionable reputation as being romantic, when in reality, it was very hard work. In some situations, the responsibilities were accompanied by long months of boredom and loneliness. At the end of a hard work day, the bunkhouse looked good to weary cowhands. Most bunkhouses were crowded and smelled of sweat, cattle, and tobacco. But it was a place where they could roll out their bedrolls, usually outside, which is where most of these roamers preferred to sleep. And in bad weather, the bunkhouse floor was a welcome respite. Lighting was provided by a coal oil lantern or a lamp. The table was used for eating, of course, but also for playing dominoes or cards, making crafts, and writing an occasional letter home. Heat, when needed, came from a fire. During the long trail drives, the chuck wagon became the headquarters for every cattle outfit on the range. Cowboys ate their meals there. It was their social center, recreational spot, a natural gathering place for exchanging windies or tall tales, listening to music, if there happened to be a musician in the group, or just recounting the experiences of the day. The invention of the chuck wagon is attributed to a Texas rancher, Charles Goodnight, in 1866. Goodnight modified the Studebaker wagon, a durable army surplus wagon to suit the needs of cowboys driving cattle from Texas to sell in New Mexico. He added a chuck box to the back of the wagon with drawers and shelves for storage space and a hinged lid to provide a flat cooking surface. A water barrel was also attached to the wagon and canvas was hung underneath to carry firewood. A wagon box was used to store cooking supplies and cowboys' personal items.
Our next stop takes us a decade forward and into the panhandle of Texas to Los Escarbados, a headquarters of the XIT Ranch. The XIT embodies the story of ranching on the plains of Texas, from the free range to enclosed grazing land backed by foreign capital and the development of small ranches and farms. Three million acres were awarded by the state to investors in exchange for construction of the Capitol building in Austin. Los S was originally located along a popular common Cheryl trail in Palmer County, Texas in the 1800s. Traders exchanged ammunition, beads, and knives with Indians for captives and stolen horses and cattle. As the common Cheryls traversed the arid plains, they dug shallow pits in a creek bed in search of water. Los Escrobatus refers to the scrapings they left in the earth. The foreman, his family, and the cowboys all used the dining room for meals. The east bedroom belonged to the manager and his wife. The central bedroom was that of the manager's sons. Upstairs was a room on the east end where as many as 60 cowboys could sleep at a time. The west and middle rooms on the second floor stored bulk provisions such as flour, cornmeal, dried fruit, and molasses. Tonight, the dining room has been cleared to make way for a holiday dance. Let's take a peek at the Los Ass Crew Dances to put your little foot right here. As more families settled into the frontier, schoolhouses began dotting the landscape. The usual ranch schoolhouse was a one-room building named for the rancher or the ranch. Others had colorful monikers like Lick Skillet, Possum Trot, Cedar Ridge, Hell Rollin' Holler, and Chicken Foot. The Bearfield Schoolhouse was briefly called Polecat University after an encounter with a skunk. Like the 16 by 16 foot Bearfield Schoolhouse from Clarendon, Texas, the schools remained as long as the children needed them. In addition to being used as classrooms, school buildings were often used for social gatherings, meetings, plays, parties, and church services. And during the holidays, schools would often host a social gathering and a Christmas pageant. It looks like the children at the Bearfield School are about to sing. On the sixth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me six geese laying, five golden Four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs>
So far, the dwellings we have visited tonight have been modest. Let's jump into the 20th century with a visit to the 1909 Barton House on Christmas Eve. It was the dream of Joseph James Barton to have his elegant two and a half story house anchor a new town that was secured by a railroad depot and a train. And although with much effort to make the town a reality, it didn't last. The Barton's home was the capstone of a planned community on a railroad line that never came through. In 1906, news came that a railroad line to connect the Santa Fe at Hereford and the Texas and Pacific line at Colorado City would pass through his TL ranch property. By 1907, land values on the South Plains skyrocketed, with acreage selling for 10 times what Barton had paid for it. The land boom gave him the idea to develop a town with a post office, lumber yard, mercantile, hotel, church, school, and as a centerpiece, a beautiful home. He started selling land to settlers and business people, and the town of Barton site developed. By 1909, the town had attracted 250 people and was supporting a hotel, lumber yard, church, and school. Barton turned his efforts to build in the elegant home he envisioned for his family. He purchased plans for the home for $45 from Modern Dwellings, a magazine published by the George F. Barber Company of Knoxville, Tennessee. The Queen Anne style house the Bartons selected had five rooms on the ground floor, five rooms on the second floor, plus two indoor bathrooms, a mansard style roof and a widow's walk. A large porch with Tuscan columns wrapped around the front and one side of the house. Most of the building materials were shipped by train to Amarillo and hauled by wagon to Barton site. Other items were purchased at the Barton side lumber yard. Doorknobs, locks, mantles, and mirrors were acquired from mail order companies. Modern features included running water in the kitchen, sliding doors, built-in closets, acetylene, carbide lighting, and a milk and meat cooler at the back of the house. The tall, spacious attic was used for storage. At this same time, many of the ranchers who had survived drought, blizzards, and the panic of 1893 began moving out of the harsh region. They sought good grassland for their cattle in a less severe climate. Then to make things worse, in 1909, the Santa Fe Company completed its line from Amarillo to Lubbock, running through Abernathy about eight miles east of Barton's site. Joseph Barton saw the inevitable demise of his planned community, and no doubt with a heavy heart, he helped move the town's businesses to Abernathy. The church went to Cotton Center. The store and post office remained in what was left of Barton's site, to serve settlers who bought and moved on to Barton land. The big house was the only home left.
As advances in technology go, it's hard to beat the impact the railroad had on the ranching industry. Let's visit the Ropes Depot on a busy winter day in 1920. The railroad depot was an exciting place, with people coming and going and cowhands returning from cattle markets. All sorts of news was brought from other towns to the far-flung settlements in the West. In the depot, all the arrangements were made for cattle movement, package and freight shipment, and passenger travel. The railroad was essential to the growth of ranching, transporting cattle, settlers, some established businesses in the towns, manufactured goods, supplies, and lumber to the plains. The wood frame ropes depot built on land once owned by Isaac L. Elwood, a manufacturer of barbed wire, opened on July 1, 1918. Traditionally, railroads had connected previous settled points, but in the West, railroads were often the forerunners and spurs to civilization. Such was the case with ropes. The depot was the first business establishment in the town. As more and more farmers and small stockmen moved into the area, the Santa Fe realized the economic value of a town site at the railroad. Work on the line began on January 1st, 1917, but was slowed by the needs of World War I. A local resident, Mrs. Blankenship, described the impact that the railroad had on the town and the surrounding area. The world had now found us. We watched the lazy prairie take on new life. Time took on importance. We could set our clock by the noonday train as it stopped to water up the railroad's giant overhead tank by its own windmill. In the 1930s and 40s, the depot revived to serve the West Texas farming community. But after World War II, the Santa Fe was forced by escalating costs and declining revenues to limit service. The last Santa Fe passenger train departed on May the 1st, 1971, and all passenger and dining cars were sold to Amtrak. The depot was closed October the 15th, 1974, and the Santa Fe offered it for sale. It was purchased by William G. McGinty and eventually donated to the National Ranching Heritage Center by his widow. Our final structure of the night is the Pitchfork Cookhouse, circa 1950, and right after dinner. Out the back door of the Pitchfork Ranch Cookhouse, 
The land dropped off to the north bank of the South Wichita River, and most days, horses grazed quietly in nearby pastures. Tame wild turkeys milled around nearby, eating corn chips thrown out for them by the cook. In all, it was an idyllic picture of both today and times gone by. The Pitchfork Land and Cattle Company officially began in 1883, but its history goes back even earlier when Eugene F. Williams and Dan Gardner, friends since their boyhood days in Mississippi, formed a partnership in December 1881. The current boundaries of the Pitchfork Ranch encompasses a cowboy's dream of excellent grass and abundant streams, easy valleys to cross, yet many breaks for protection from the rare northers. These conditions are what brought cattlemen to Pitchfork Country after the military campaigns ended the threat of Indian attack. Located in the Rolling Plains, 80 miles east of Lubbock, the Pitchfork is a mix of flat, open terrain on the northeast side and the rougher Croton Breaks to the west and south. The South Wichita River runs 10 miles through the ranch and the headquarters sits near the north bank. The Pitchfork Ranch is defined by its geography. The Big Croton and the Little Croton run together to form Croton Creek and the Croton Breaks. Such names as West Croton, Dripping Springs, and River and Shinery Pastures indicate the influence of the terrain. The breaks provide a challenge for horse and rider. Other areas of the ranch could have been named by a Hollywood script writer. Brushy Pasture, Dark Canyon, and West Long Canyon. In so large an area, the one place where everyone could come together on the vast ranch was the cookhouse. The simple wood frame structure was a sanctuary for family reunions, birthday parties, and of course, daily meals for the ranch hands and cowboys since its construction around 1900. Thank you.
Well, that's the end of our journey through candlelight at the ranch. I hope you enjoyed the trail as much as I did. Good night, everybody, and a very Merry Christmas. I hope you've enjoyed this trip down the trail as we looked at the development of ranching and life on the prairie over the past 200 years. Many thanks to our trail boss, Red Stegall. I can't think of a better ambassador to tell the story of ranching. And many thanks to the hundreds of ranch hosts who have volunteered to bring candlelight at the ranch to life each year. We owe a tremendous debt to the board of directors and members of the Ranching Heritage Association. 50 years ago, the National Ranching Heritage Center was just a dream, but through the hard work of members across the country who partnered with Texas Tech University, it came to life. More information is available about ranching, the National Ranching Heritage Center, and Candlelight at the Ranch at www.ttu.edu. And from all of us at the National Ranching Heritage Center, Happy, Happy Holidays! Holidays.